On today's episode, NASA reveals three lunar rovers, Elon Musk has a new plan for Starship, Blue Origin is back in action, and new engines for SLS. Three brand new lunar rover design teams have just been selected by NASA to compete for the chance to demonstrate their unpressurized crewed rover concepts on the moon, and one of them looks like an anime race car. The choices were announced on April 3rd during a press conference at the Johnson Space Center with follow-up posts on social media. Teams led by Intuitive Machines, Lunar Outpost, and Venturi Astrolab were selected to advance to the final phase of this competition to see who could design a better rover for use at the Lunar South Pole. So far, each team has submitted a design for a rover which can be driven by astronauts and are open to the elements, with the understanding that these designs will be modeled further by this next phase of the competition, which will land the winner a contract worth $4.6 billion. Lunar Outpost leads a group of engineers from companies like Lockheed Martin, General Motors, and Goodyear, and their Lunar Dawn design looks a bit like a pickup truck. Large body panels form a semi-enclosed cabin with a flatbed on the back that appears to serve as cargo storage and work platform complete with some sort of winch or crane arm. Astrolab and their partners Axiom Space and Odyssey Space Research have put forward their impressive Flex rover prototype, its cube-shaped body capable of holding crew and cargo, while offering a range of modular options and tools, including a robotic arm. The vehicle itself can fold up to fit more efficiently into a launch vehicle and also unfolds to accept larger payloads. And then there's Intuitive Machines. Their team is pulled from AVL, Boeing, Michelin, and Northrop Grumman, and they easily have the most outlandish design out of the whole bunch. The Moon Racer is a low-sitting, sleek design and looks very much like a race car. It seems to have plenty of storage and is definitely the most stylish of the whole bunch. Each of these teams and their prototypes will now be given some funding. We're not exactly sure how much, but Intuitive Machines let slip that they have been awarded $30 million for this next phase. Regardless of how much financial support they get, the three teams will then have 12 months to finish a prototype that can demonstrate the following criteria. First, the vehicle must be able to operate with or without crew. This means that they are able to be steered remotely by a NASA technician on Earth when no crew members are present. Next, each team needs to meet a 10-year operating life, which means that they need to either deliver a vehicle that can last for a decade on the moon, or deliver 10 vehicles that last one year each, or anywhere in between. The goal is simply to have active rovers for NASA and their astronauts to use at all times for the next 10 years. The teams have also been told that they can't have more than a 10 meter difference from their positioning systems at any time. NASA wants to make sure their crews will know where they are within a pretty slim margin of error, which is a pretty tall order when you remember that the moon doesn't have GPS. And of course, each vehicle will need to have the ability to gather and store electricity all on their own, supporting crewed trips of up to 8 hours in length. They'll need to move at least as fast as 15 kilometers per hour and hold 20 kilometers of charge on board with the capacity to survive a lunar night cycle. All of these requirements will be judged at the end of the 12-month period, but during that time, each team will be given time with NASA to help sharpen their design to the best it can be. At the moment, the administration is ensure it can award the demonstration contract to more than one team, so they want each of these designs to be as complete as possible. In that regard, Astrolab has the biggest head start. Their Flex rover has had a full-scale working prototype for about two years now with its test drives in Death Valley, California, gaining the attention of SpaceX, who have already signed an agreement to take Flex to the moon on board their Starship rocket in 2026. Whoever wins will get the demonstration section of this contract and have their prototype sent to the moon and tested before the Artemis V crew arrives in 2030, and should that go well, will become NASA's staple crew rover. Well, we should say unpressurized crew rover because a final teaser during the April 3rd conference was that NASA will be making an announcement for a pressurized rover next week. Vehicles with sealed cabins would significantly extend the duration of lunar road trips and would mean even more traffic. NASA might have to consider building the first moon roads at this rate. During a recent presentation at Starbase Texas, 
Elon Musk outlined the company's plans for the next test flight of their prototype Super Heavy rocket and their strategy for the rest of 2024. A video of this presentation was posted to the SpaceX social media page on x.com on April 6 and after a little preamble, showed Musk discussing the current plan for the fourth test flight of Starship, which he said is currently being planned for May. This lines up with comments made by COO Gwyn Shotwell in March, just after the third test flight ended in a loss of both vehicles. At the time, Shotwell spoke about the company's focus on rapid turnaround for the next tests so that they could iterate faster and work out the kinks as soon as possible. That iteration, completing tests as rapidly as possible in order to weed out the big issues, is something that Elon talked about during his presentation as well and described the next test launch as being pivotal for plans going forwards. First up, SpaceX wants to put Starship through the high heating regime again, referring to the extreme heat of re-entry that caused the vehicle to break apart at the end of the last test flight. Solving this issue is a major stepping stone to landing Starship on a pad somewhere, and if they can get it to push past the heat, Elon says he wants to make a controlled splat into the ocean, control being another thing SpaceX needs to test on their rocket. The first stage booster appeared wildly unstable after making an impressive boost back burn maneuver during IFT-3, and then the second stage ship was seen helplessly rolling around as it burned up in the atmosphere. So obviously control is another sticking point for the fourth test flight. Elon did say that they will be aiming to land the booster on a virtual tower in the Gulf this time, which he did not elaborate on, so maybe they're going to demonstrate being able to slow the booster's fall to near zero. That is what would be needed to encourage SpaceX to try and land the booster back at the launch site for Test Flight 5, which is something Elon says would be possible if IFT-4 manages to land on his virtual tower. Even Musk thinks this is a little ambitious, but he went on to say that he believes there is about an 80 to 90% chance of successfully grabbing a returning Super Heavy booster in the Mechazilla Chopstick arms by the end of this year. And if IFT-4 doesn't demonstrate the control they need to sign off on a Starbase landing attempt, then Elon says the company is ready to build up to six more vehicles this year to support the increased pace of test launches. SpaceX has been manufacturing their Starships and boosters at an impressive rate already, but Musk says that the new factory being built at Boca Chica's Starbase will increase that production rate a lot next year. This production rate would allow the SpaceX team to apply new improvements to their vehicle, creating Starship version 2 using new Raptor engine improvements that Musk says will increase its thrust from 230 to 280 metric tons force of thrust, with potentially up to 330 metric tons force. The plan after that, he says, is to test and iterate through new Starship versions at the Texas site, and then perform the operational launches from Cape Canaveral in Florida, all while working to further improve the Starship design to be even cheaper to use. As usual, plans are quick to change as new information comes out, and testing Starship tends to bring up a lot of new information. The date for Starship's next launch holding in May is a good sign, so we can likely look forward to that. Otherwise, we should see how well they can control their rocket on the descent this time and get excited for new tests and increased production afterwards. On April 4th, Blue Origin announced that their suborbital commercial crew vehicle, New Shepard, would finally be heading back to the launch pad with a crew for the first time after an explosion during an uncrewed flight in September of 2022. The launch date wasn't part of the announcement, but it will seemingly be the next flight of this rocket, which successfully launched back in December, with no crew just in case. At the time, Blue Origin said that their first crewed launch would be coming soon, so it looks like the company is still keeping that date close to the vest. We do know that this mission, NS-25, will be carrying a full six-person crew, including Ed Dwight, a former NASA astronaut candidate and Air Force pilot who never got to go into space. Ed is reportedly just a week older than William Shatner, who flew on a new Shepard back in 2021, so if he makes the trip, Ed will officially become the oldest person to make it to space, which would certainly be some nice press for the new Shepard. The 2022 explosion just after liftoff was startling because just a month prior, a similarly crewed mission had flown, and even though the capsule's escape systems work perfectly, it's not exactly comforting to anyone looking to pay for tickets to see space, for the vehicle to detonate. New Shepard spent almost 15 months grounded while investigations found the engine nozzle failure that had caused the alarming explosion and the resultant fixes to ensure the rocket was safe to fly in again. 
But given that a full crew signed up to fly on this mission, it seems that Blue Origin won't have much trouble finding new customers for their space tourism business. NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi announced that the new RS-25 rocket engine being developed for use on the SLS Artemis mission rocket has completed its second and final certification testing. The April 3rd test consisted of a full-duration static fire, 500 seconds of full-strength burn, putting out a little over 1,800 kilonewtons of force. This test was the last in a 12-run series that started in October of 2023, designed to put the new materials and manufacturing techniques of this liquid hydrogen-fueled engine through their paces. Currently, NASA's Space Launch System is powered by four original RS-25 engines, which have been modified from the space shuttles. So it has obviously been a priority for them to design an updated version for use during the Artemis lunar missions. This is where the new construction methods come in, as much of the new engines are reportedly 3D printed based on technology demonstrations like the Ramfire nozzle tests back in October last year. 3D printed parts plus modern actuators, flex ducts, and turbo pumps have been used to create an RS-25 with a 30% reduced parts cost without sacrificing power or efficiency. The success of these tests means that Aerojet Rocketdyne, the makers of the RS-25, going back all the way to the shuttle days, have secured their contract with NASA to provide 24 new engines for use in the SLS launches for Artemis missions 5 to 9. The real question, however, is if these new engines will help stabilize the notoriously finicky SLS. If the new parts work as well as they have in testing, the reliability of NASA's rocket could be much better going forward.